Good afternoon. My name is said. My name is Julie Thomas. Um, I lead um, diversity, inclusion, and well-being for Zurich globally, um, and I'm also responsible for engaging our employees in related initiatives and programs. So I've been doing that since about October from a global level. Before then, I led DNI in the UK, creating our diversity inclusion strategy, and then integrating our existing wellbeing offering into a more holistic approach to a healthy work environment. Um, since then, Haley's taken on my UK role, and she's been accelerating momentum, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And, but since in the last nine months, I guess I've been leveraging the lessons learned in the UK on a global platform and really been trying to drive um, the global approach to diversity, inclusion and well-being. So to give you a little bit of insight about Zurich, um, we're one of the world's largest insurance groups. We have about 54,000 employees operating about 36 countries. So you can imagine that uh, kind of understanding the diverse needs of individuals factoring in social and legislative requirements can be quite a challenge when it comes to comms and engagement. So I'm going to come back a little bit later and talk about um, kind of how we've empowered local countries to discuss well-being and, to, and, and launch well-being campaigns, and also how we've integrated that whole diversity and inclusion and well-being. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Hayley, who's going to talk to you too a little bit about a case study in the UK, about how we've kind of leveraged the communications platform there. Hi everyone, um, my name is Hayley Golden and I'm from New Zealand, so I apologise in, in advance because I do tend to speak quite quickly, anyone feel free to slow me down like this. Um, I also have anxiety, so it's quite ironic that public speaking sets me off, so we'll see how I go. Um, I've got some cue cards, so they should keep me on track, but we will get started. So. In the UK, we are a really large business. Um, I've come from New Zealand, where the most people I've looked after is a thousand, so we're heading into six and a half thousand territory, so for me, it was quite new. Um, we are quite dispersed, so in the UK, we're across 21 sites. Um, we have 953 home workers or home and field workers, which leaves us with around 5,550 office based workers. So we're quite a different array of people that we need to meet their needs and um, deal with isolation and things like that. Uh, wellbeing in the UK started out, was always um, headed out of the HR function, and it was really led by a bunch of wellbeing reps um, inconsistently across the UK who have a real drive for wellbeing and a real investment in it. So it was about leveraging them to get the most we could out of them. Um, over time, it's, it's evolved, as I know all of you will. There'll be a lot of repetition in this, so hopefully that's okay. But it has evolved. We've realised the, the business of it, uh, the importance of it to our business um, in terms of driving that performance, but also the corporate social responsibility piece and doing no harm. So. Uh, as Julie said, we also look after DNI, and um, we are dealing with a, a vast array of people from multiple generations, multiple ethnicities, cultures, um, disabilities, and LGBT backgrounds. So it's really trying to weave in something that's going to meet everyone's needs. Um, we have started to look at wellbeing in a much more structured way in the last year, year and a half. So this is actually stolen from Mercer, so I apologise because I meant to put Mercer on the bottom and I forgot, so for anyone from Mercer, please forgive me. Um, and so traditionally wellbeing's really been focused around your physical, um, your physical and your nutrition. So I think we're probably all aware of that in the room. Uh, and where, we've, where we focus is we do look at physical and nutrition, but we've also started to look at lifestyle. And we're moving into the third area here between wellness um, and fitness, and we've tied in mental health, which is probably quite common for those of you in the room, but also we've tacked on organisational performance. So there's a really large correlation between the workplace being the leading cause of mental ill health, so it's starting to look at how our practices are causing ill health within our employees and our responsibility there. Moving forward, we're starting to tie in um, devices like Heartbeat and look at things like engagement and productivity and how they drive our culture, what we want our culture to be. So how does all of this translate into a plan of action? So we have five main things that we look at at Zurich. So we look at mental health. Um, by 2020, mental health will be the second leading cause of disability, and by 2030, it will be the first, the primary cause of disability um, worldwide. And so we know that that's an area we need to work on, and we're taking proactive steps. 
We're working on the delivery of a mental health management program and that's one that empowers our managers through educating them on mental health awareness. So picking up the signs of stress, depression and anxiety in their employees and acting on that. We're also working to educate our employees on that as well. We are training up a large number of our workforce on mental health first aid and we are just looking at my list, um, we're getting a mental health employee resource group. So we are really starting to push that area. We've also partnered with a, a local university in the area and through them we're running mindfulness studies. So just the, the meditation piece and seeing what impact that has on our employees. It's great for our employees because they get to trial it to see if it works for them and it's great for us to work out what productivity and link to engagement that has because we're getting some of that information back. Um, we're a huge advocate of volunteering. We have the Zurich Community Trust, which was set up quite some time ago, and we really use our employees to go and help those um, who need help in the community. We do a lot of sponsorship. Um, we have good linkages with MIND, the Mental Health Foundation, things like that. So we utilise them because we know that um, volunteering has such a great impact on someone's mental health. And we're looking to leverage our connections with our other DNI networks. So we've got disability, we've got gender, we've got cultural, and we've got LGBT. So it's really how they all cross over. The next thing we are looking at is nutrition and lifestyle. So probably uh, not as complex here as the mental health area. I think we need to focus a lot more of our energy these days on mental health. Um, so we are educating our employees on good diet and nutrition and giving them better access to healthier options. So we have, we have on-site canteens at most of our sites. So it's about what we provide through there. And if we've got vending machines, how can we incorporate healthy options and things like that? We also have started bringing in nutritionists and sleep specialists to help our employees understand the links between what they're eating and the impact on their body. So um, when they're stressed and their gut isn't digesting properly, how that impacts their sleep and a number of other things like that, which are quite useful. And as I said, we're working with our in-house cafeteria. Uh, physical health, so we, uh, we're raising awareness of our existing benefits. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot in the physical health space at the moment. We've got the bike to, bike to work scheme that I'm sure most people have um, and a couple of other things, but we are reviewing at the moment to really accelerate that attention. And we are also um, in the process of finalising a market-leading high-performance app. So um, basically, it it's a preventative health measure and it targets genetic health, fitness and technical markers in an individual. So that individual can work out through their genetic makeup and the information that comes back to them what their peak performance is. So through an app it nudges certain behaviours, it gives instant feedback, it gives um, individualised workouts and that helps them work out their productivity points. So we're really excited about that. Um, Organisational design so the six management standards, um, they are things that lead to poor mental ill health and poor overall health. They are demand, control, role, relationships, change and support. You may be familiar with them, but these things, when we don't control them properly and we're not transparent and open with employees, they start to affect someone's health. So we all know that change management has a really big impact when you partner that with lack of control and then lack of awareness of what my new role will be. These things start to compound and they have quite a big effect. We're also overlaying that with demographics because we know that once you move people away, you get isolation and once in a certain age bracket, you're more likely to encounter things. So for example, women over age 55 have a much higher rate of anxiety and depression. So how does that feed into what we're doing? We're developing manager guidance, um, so our managers are more aware of it, and we're starting to overlay these things with our big practices, such as change management and onboarding. So where do these six factors hit our, our organisation practice, and what can we do to try and minimise that, knowing that the outcome might be ill health? And we're continuing to review our MI on an ongoing basis. And lastly, you, you may be familiar with the five ways to wellbeing. Um, they come out of the National Economics Foundation, the evidence-based ways to improve mental health. Um, and they are connect, 
which um, Cisco were talking about, which is a, fantastic for your health. Be active, give, keep learning, and take notice. So we try to overlay these five ways to well-being with our four pillars just to make sure that we are meeting those and encouraging those. And they come out of the work that in the work well model, if you've seen that as well. So um, it's a pretty big job to tackle 21 sites and remote workers and field workers and home workers. So how do we do that through communications? Um, we use a number of things. So we use Yammer. You, I don't know if you're familiar with Yammer in the room. It's a social networking tool. It's like Facebook. It's for business. Um, or chatter, you might have heard of that. So it's really encouraging our employees to collaborate. They can go into different topics, they can talk about it, share information, share what's going on on the site, and they can get that there. We also use email. Um, unfortunately, I think we all suffer from too much email. I know that I do, um, and we can get fatigued from it. But the other thing we know is that some of our employees respond to that, so we don't want to take it away, because we do need to use different avenues to actually capture everyone. And when we've got really important wellbeing messages, we'll send them from our CEO, because that tends to get more attention. Um, our employees, as with probably all of your employees, love a bit of a chat, a um, bit of gossip, and so word of mouth spreads things really quickly, which is great for us. And the intranet is also another factor that we, we do use a lot because it's another channel. And so we have our homepage, um, and that gets dedicated attention to things that are happening that week that are of high importance. So we can facilitate that avenue to really say to people, hey, look, this is important, you need to look at this. We have a collaboration site for wellbeing that's an overarching page and then individual locations off that. And um, like I said earlier, we have Yammer. We also have banners that can run across the bottom called Snapchats, and they're quite useful. We have events, so we have wellbeing weeks three times a year this year. Um, we had our main wellbeing week in April, followed by a mental health week that we didn't quite get off the ground, and a nutrition week, which is coming in November. We link in with our unions for those because they have a lot of learning materials. We link in with our employee assistance program because they are really underutilised and they have a number of freebies, so I really encourage you to look into that. They often have a calendar of webinars. They'll do one a month about health and wellbeing, um, so use that. And we link in with our Zurich Community Trust because, like I said, volunteering is a huge impact on mental health. We use TV and SNAP communications. I think I'm out of sync with my slides, but that's okay. Um, oh, yep, yeah, I am out of sync. Um, and lots of education sessions, the so face-to-face manager training. And our managers really um, respond to that quite well, much better than I ever expected, but mental health is an issue that they want to talk about. Um, and they might be a bit shy at the beginning, but it is something that um, works well. Now, none of this would would work if we didn't have dedicated reps across the country. We don't have them for all of our sites because they're self-selected. So um, we have them at the majority of our sites, but some of our sites are quite small. Um, people are, are overworked. We've had a lot of change. We've got a lot of change fatigue. So we do need to get some more reps up and running. They, they're the backbone of wellbeing, so they, and they tell us what they need for their sites, and they get going with that, which is great. We also have a number of other things. Um, we've got quite a few people... Um, as was said earlier, who are really proactive. So they love doing London Marathon, stuff like that, that freaks me out. Um, and they'll get out there and they'll be like, you know, sponsor me, and they'll get all over the internet. And it's a really good way to promote that well-being message. And so we need to use them more. So before I hand back to Julie, um, for the UK in our case study, basically we are in our infancy, but we're, we've made great strides and we're really looking forward to moving ahead. And we've got support from the top, which is great. Um, it is a struggle to get to 6,500 people, I'm not going to lie. It's really hard and you can't please everybody. Um, and also working across multiple generations, they need different things. So that's where we need to start weaving in DNI because one approach just won't suit them all. Um, encouraging people to find the time is another thing. They, it's just not really a commitment that they want to make or they don't see um, the benefit to them. And um, they don't understand that that a healthy body and mind will support high performance. So it's really getting that message out there. Um, but I suppose in closing, it's, um, it is embedding and um, it's something that we want to be an everyday consideration. So that's the UK and I'll hand back to Julie. Thanks Hayley. Okay. 
So as Hayley's just said, I mean, the, the UK's got some great, great stories. Um, but even um, across the countries, we're seeing some, some really great wellbeing campaigns being rolled out um, in Ireland. Our Tackle Your Feelings initiative is reducing the stigma of mental health in the workplace. In Italy, the office has gone smoke-free and they've converted those zones into baby zones so that um, if parents find that their child minding falls through, they can bring their children into the office to them if they, with them if they want to. And in Switzerland, we're about to pilot um, a wearable devices um, tool um, to help with lower back pain. They both break when they slouch. Um, and I think with all of those things, as, as with all the stuff that Haley said, is actually they're, they're all very, very different things, but they all fall under the well-being banner, but they all sit within our global priorities. So I'll develop the business case and set the priority pillars and a framework, um, and our executive committee will sign that off and they will give it their backing. But we make it flexible enough so that the local countries can... Um, kind of pull, pull on the levers that they need to address um, local challenges. And um, I think the thing is, uh, oh, I'm going to go into that one, is um, kind of how do we get them to think about that? And I, I think um, the approach we, we have is relevant when you've, whether you've got one office, multiple offices, multiple audiences, or multiple countries. Um, when we're starting out with a wellbeing campaign, we ask one simple question of ourselves and of our employees. What does well-being mean to you? So I can tell you what it means to me. It means going for a run, having a glass of wine, playing with my children, reading a book, not necessarily all in that order. Um, Hayley, what does well-being mean to you? Um, to me, well-being, I'm not sure if I'm on, oh, I'm on. Yeah. Um, well-being means to me, I travel a lot of countries, I'm up to 62, um, and I love to continue to build that. It means meditation or mindfulness and um, often just a really good psychology book. Mm. Yeah. So two very different responses from two people on the stage. And actually, if I asked you all on your Slido app to respond to the question, what does me well-being to mean to you? I'm sure we'd get a load of different responses. So feel free to put it down there, what you think well-being means to you, and I'm, we might pick them up later. But what I'd expect to see is a breadth and a variety of responses. And that's because well-being is very personal, and it's made up of a number of things. Um, it could be financial recognition, and um, a number, a number of things. But I won't, I won't list them all. I'll, I'll show you as this instead. So, this is a visual I use when I'm talking about diversity, inclusion, and well-being in Zurich. Um, it's a good conversation piece, and it's, it's part of a bigger thing. It's more of a holistic approach, a healthy work environment. Um, what's really handy um, about this is that it will help you to uh, identify and categorize what you're already doing um, and help you with uh, kicking off comms and communications based on things that you already do. So if we look at some of those bubbles, work-life balance, I'm sure many of you have flexible working in some guys that you're in, in your organization, um, or that whole kind of approach to mental, um, you know, mental well-being, feeling more accountable and empowered to do what you want, or even just avoiding that sapping commute. But we quite often talk about flexible working under that kind of gender balance and talent attraction. Um, and actually, we should consider talking more about the well-being approach of uh, well-being um, benefits of that as well. Or benefits, you know, I'm sure that many of you have employee assistance programs. They're the most underutilized, underpromoted tools in an organization. Um, you should be shouting from the rooftops about them. Um, who's, who, who can get, who can take part in them? Is it just employees, family, or friends? And what, what do they cover? Mediation, bereavement, or even transitioning in the workplace. It's really good stuff. So, um, what I, what, what, how do you kind of get started? How do you kind of get, get this thing going? So this is, this is um, I'm quite proud of this. So last summer, uh, I had my interns, all of our interns worked on one project all summer on how they could get Zurich fit for the future. And um, their personal insights and their research brought back the most amazing piece of work I've ever seen. I was really proud of it. So I'm just going to share a little bit about their approach because then I can go and tell them I did it. So... Um, their approach was um, to keep your, keep your approach simple, engaging, and adaptable. In terms of simple, you know, we want people to want to help with their own well-being because then they'll consider it more and they'll do it more. So design activities that are really simple and really easy to get involved with because actually you've already asked them what well-being means to them, so you already know what they need. And then as an organisation, you have to work out what you're most comfortable and what you can actually deliver. And also use the key milestone dates, World Mental Health Day, Work Life Week, because as Hayley said, there'll be a wealth of um, supporting documentation out there that you can already pull on so you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and talk about what you've already got, like those 
bespoke to work schemes. Um, engaging. Um, we know that it's really important to get as many people involved in well-being as possible because then it's quicker to embed in the culture, bless you. And um, to, do, to do that, um, you can um, kind of pull on your well-being champions, utilize your employee resource groups, and make sure you utilize as many channels as possible, and find out from your audiences what weight to place on each of those channels, which ones that they're most interested in, and make sure you position your communications in those channels. And um, storytelling. It really, I mean, we've heard it here, I'm sure you've heard it all day. Storytelling is probably the most critical thing in enabling those self-awareness moments that can create a mind shift. Um, it takes real bravery. So tell your own personal story if you have one or see if you can find someone else to help. Because in the last 18 months, we have seen an amazing uh, shift in the number of people that will come and tell us and be happy to share their stories just based off one or two initial stories. And initially they were anonymous and then they came out and it was great. So that's a really important thing and adaptable. And I've talked about this before, which is to kind of set your kind of framework and perhaps your pillars, but enable your employees to mold some of your initiatives and then they'll naturally adapt to suit the needs of the organization. So um, I was just very briefly going to summarize what Haley and I have been talking about for the last 20 minutes. These are just some of our top tips in how to kind of get the engagement going. There are two things, only two things off here I was going to pick up. One was language. Uh, I could do a whole session on language if I was allowed to, but I won't. Um, so things like the word stress, it's very overused. Um, and it's kind of got negative connotations, but stress can be a good thing. Stress before a race can help get you pumped up so you get going. Stress before I got onto the stage is helping me through. Um, but it, you know, let's think about other words like anxiety and depression, which are actually the outcomes of an environment where people don't have enough time to recharge and get their energies. And the other one is resilience. Yeah, I'll get my bugbears out today. This would be very cathartic for me. So resilience, it means kind of unbreakable and, and strong and strength. How about using the word resourceful, which is about giving your employees tools to improve rather than telling them to toughen up, or energies. So energies are what we need to perform, and it's energy and passion that drives the giving extra that we need. And so the last thing was celebrate success, and that comes back to that healthy visual um, environment that I was, I, uh, I was show, healthy work environment and visual that I was showing you. You know, um, recognize what you're doing well, recognize your champions, recognize those brave storytellers, because that will really help to keep the momentum going. And then just before we opened up the Q&A, hey, oh, I don't know if this is going to work because we haven't trialed it, by the way. Hayley and I wanted to share with you a short video as well on the five steps um, to, uh, is it mental health? Cool. And um, just because we think there's a couple of real snippets in there to help you um, to engage and connect with your employees as well. And do I need to get anything to do to play that? Or is it just going to play? No, it's not going to just play. Is it going to play?
So thank you very much indeed, uh, Hayley and Julie, for that. That's a great presentation. Uh, we've had plenty of questions, you'll be glad to know, and also time to even take a couple of them, <laughs> which is great. Um, so I think the top question which I'm, I'm going to ask, because I think it's a really important thing, and you've already briefly touched on it, Julie, yeah. is where you put the boundaries around stress, mm -hmm. and when stress is an issue, and when it's a part of an appropriate level of what you need to make this presentation happen and things like that and where do you put those boundaries where do you define do you know them? I it's a really individual thing actually and thing I think what I would I would say is is to kind of empower people to talk about what their own personal tipping point is so to kind of find your own personal tipping point but I but as an organization so that's one thing but as an organization I think we don't really talk about the impact of stress on people's energy. So um, at Zurich, we've stuck. I say we started. I'm not saying we're there, but we have started to link the whole performance management piece with kind of energy and stress. So when people are looking at performance, they're looking at like skills, behaviours, knowledge, expertise. Oh, there's something missing. Energy. Energy means performance. So if you're actually um, as a as a team you're ticking all these boxes but you're not performing, you need to look lower down and start to have a look at kind of where the energy is and, and what we need to do as a team to help to um, kind of fix that issue and that could be greater collaboration, greater knowledge sharing, greater flexible working, uh, downtime, different ways of having meetings, going out for a walk. So it's kind of down to individuals and teams to kind of work out how that might work for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I Am I on? Um, so when I roll it out in the organisation, I, I actually take it back to the biological level. So I talk about the fact that we have adrenaline all day, every day. It just drips away. You don't even know that it's there, but it's, it's when it gets sparked off. So like when you trip on the pavement and you get that massive heart rush and it's a massive release of adrenaline. And due to how we've evolved, we, this happens in the workplace. We get fr frustrated, we get stressed, we get a massive burst of adrenaline. But back in the Neanderthal days, you'd run away from that. You can't do that at work. It'd be great if you could, um, but you can't, and you can't throw your computer out the window. So, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty stuck. Now, that's okay if that happens okay occasionally, but when that happens over a consistent period of time and your stress is at that same level over a consistent period, that is when you get into the territory of it turning into depression and anxiety, either either. either. They're both on the same scale. But I try to explain that to people to help them understand also that stresses, stresses there's a reason that it is not medically defined because it is... Uh, a perceived threat. So it's how you're responding, how you're choosing to respond to a perceived threat, and everybody's going to be different. Whereas when you move into anxiety and depression territory, that's where you're going to have that chemical imbalance and that shift. So that's how I try to define it um, to my people. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. There's just one more question that I very, very briefly like to touch on, because, not least because it's about my favourite subject in the world, which is sleep. Yeah. And um, uh, do you have anything particular that you do to help employees sleep and improve their sleep habits? Um, at the moment, we're running the mindfulness study that I talked about with the, universe, with the local university. So that um, in itself does link into sleep. We've also had sleep sessions where we're encouraging people to think about um, like it was said earlier, their devices when they use their devices, but also other things like magnesium. Have they got enough magnesium? Are they taking magnesium? Other supplements like that that come from some PhD um, or some professors that we've brought into the organisation. So they talk to our people about the different ways um, they can address sleep. But it does come back to there's the argument that uh, it's not actually about eight hours. Everybody's different, and at different stages in your life, you're going to need different amounts of sleep. So once you're over 45, your sleep will start to drop down. Um, once you hit 65, I think you're averaging around four hours a night. So sorry for everybody out there, it gets worse. Um, but that's that's kind of how we're addressing it. Yeah. Cool. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Sadly, we're out of time, but very much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed.